Um, wave. Adrian, wave. There you go. Hey. All right. Just in case I don't get anything, um, the I think you may have seen an email about um, communications wants to do a story on physics since we're so awesome. So um, uh, I'm going to send them a screen cap of this, uh, and we might screen cap uh, students in Ad Lab with their oscilloscopes today. So because we're so awesome and cool. Uh, other than that, before we get started, I just sent out um, a, um, an email, actually an announcement on uh, Moodle to remind you of a couple of things. One is that the uh, reflections are actually part of your grade, so you need to do them. Um, and they're most useful if they're done at the end of the week. So um, please do it, and then in the future, let's do it, um, make sure you do it on Friday after class. The reason why is that I'm getting feedback on how we're doing and what, whether I need to change things. Um, and I got some useful feedback. Um, as I said in, in the message, there's, it can be a little hard to see uh, the forest for the trees where we are right now. This is sort of like the first chapter in Griffiths, right? So we're going through some of the foundation stuff. And then eventually we're going to use, we'll see a lot of this um, in physical examples and I'm trying to build those physical examples in the problem sets. Um, so make sure you do that and also include in that a statement about either a question or the thing that was most troubling, concerning, weird, difficult, and if nothing was, just say nothing was. I'm good. That's fine too, but just to get full 10 out of 10 and that's 15% of your grade, please do that. Okay. And if you haven't done that or if you did only part of it last week, um, go in and edit it please, so I can give you a good grade. Um, so you can earn a good grade. All right, and in the homework, I uh, posted a couple of, there's been some questions about uh, some of the homeworks and I gave you a couple of hints about the homeworks, especially regarding uh, some of the convergence stuff in chapter 1.2. With respect to some of the expansion 1.3, you just need to keep, be careful about what you expand when. So in particular, 1.3.11, you take the full expansion, that's the energy, the Dirac energy term, and you expand it out into three terms, essentially. And then you take the expression for S and you expand it out into two terms, that is only to gamma squared, not gamma, all the way down to gamma to the fourth. And then you have two terms that'll depend, that now no longer depend on S, and you expand both of those terms and then you basically keep everything that is gamma to the fourth and lower. Make sense? Um, the due date for the homework or the due time is five o'clock today, but you'll notice that I haven't put a strict time limit on that. So if it's eight o'clock tonight, fine. Um, I'm not gonna grade it tonight. So aim for five, five-ish, an astronomer's five. There we go. All right, any questions? All right, let's, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, uh, today we're going to start, uh, essentially a week on complex analysis and we're going to start that with just some, um, uh, a little bit of stuff on complex variables, um, which I can see you all. So if you look in the reading and hopefully you've done the reading, um, actually, one, two, three. Uh, we, we start in chapter one and then head over to, I think, chapter 11. Um, and as I mentioned in the email, where we're headed is essentially uh, doing what are called Laurent expansions and uh, using the full um, uh, tools of uh, Cauchy and Laurent um, complex analysis to essentially evaluate interesting intervals 
in particular physically interesting uh, variables. But we'll start uh, because uh, in sort of the, the informal survey, it didn't seem like uh, a lot of people had a, a deep uh, background in complex analysis. I know you've seen complex variables, um, so we'll start um, small and get bigger. So uh, for our definitions, we'll start with a complex number and then eventually to complex function. So complex number Z, where Z is defined uh, essentially in an X and Y plane. So uh, in other words, we can write this as X zero plus zero Y, and that's equal to a real value and an imaginary value. Um, with, of course, um, I equal to sort of minus one. And hopefully I'll be able to write my eyes um, reasonably. But you know me, and unfortunately Ripu is not here to correct my writing, so good luck with that. Um, all right, graphically, um, the reason why we're writing this is that we can represent this as a set of numbers uh, on the x and y plane, namely that we can have a point with values x and y that has a distance r and an angle theta from the x plane. And we can make full use of the usual representation for x and y in plane polar coordinates. And then from that, we can write that Z is equal to R times cosine theta plus I sine theta, which is a representation that if you haven't seen um, explicitly, certainly you've seen uh, implicitly. Um, it's from this that we can start looking at uh, an exponential form, and this will be the first time, and we'll circle back to this uh, in just a bit. Uh, namely, recall from last week that you can represent e to the x as a sum. Uh, in this case, it isn't a sum, just going to subsume uh, the limits as x to the n over n factorial. And that means that if we write e to the i theta, we can break this up into odd and even terms. Right? So one way of doing that um, is to just start with um, n equals zero to infinity of i theta to the n over n factorial, but then um, we'll break it up into the sum, we'll use nu, from nu to zero of infinity of i theta to the two new over two new factorial, so all the even terms, plus the sum from zero to infinity of i theta two new plus one over two new plus one i. Okay. So what that gives us is since we have uh, these i's floating around, uh, the sum from zero to infinity of minus um, one to the new, theta two new over two new factorial plus, and we'll pull the i out, the sum from zero to infinity of minus one new times theta raised to the two new plus one over two new plus one factorial. All of this is so that we can represent this as cosine theta and this, well, this, not including the i, as sine theta, right? If we go back to um, that part in chapter one, and in fact, I'm sure you've seen before, 
um, that you can represent cosines and sines and sums as, as uh, uh, those uh, exponentials. Um, so I'll give this a 0.5. All of this is to circle back to um, equation 8.4. So that we can write that z is equal to r times e to the i theta. Um, so that means that we can represent these uh, complex numbers in a number of different ways. So for example, e to the i pi is equal to what? Negative one. Yeah, negative one. If you think about it on the uh, complex plane, pi is that angle, so you sweep over, and so that would be equal to minus one e to the i pi halves would be equal to i, because that would be 90 degrees up. Um, we also have r as the absolute value of the complex number, which we can write in a couple of different ways, as we'll see, or as x squared plus y squared. And theta is, as always, the inverse tangent of y over Okay, so pretty straightforward. Um, presumably you've seen things like this already. Um, let's see how everybody's doing. Okay. Before we deal with, uh, well, in order to deal with uh, operations, we need to also um, identify what we mean by complex functions. And eventually the goal here is to be able to identify complex functions functions in a complex plane. And then since we're physicists, we want to be able to take the derivatives and the integrals of things in a complex plane. So we'll define a function w of c as a uh, purely, a set of purely real functions, u of x and y plus i times v of x and y. Where again, uh, these are pure real. Um, that means uh, if we suppose f of z is equal to say z1 times z2, then f of z is equal to x1 plus i1 times x2 plus i y2, which if we just do that multiplication would be equal to ru plus rv. As an example. Okay. Um, and it's from this that we can define things like uh, the real part, right? So e.g., um, okay, so you have to forgive me for my um, fancy R's of W of C is U of X to Y. And my, shit, <laughs> not that one. Um, mm, Ooh, fancy I ish. Um, of Z equals B of X, Y. I'll try not to inflict that on you too many times. You just say things are real and imaginary instead of trying to do that. Okay. So, so far we've um, identified numbers, we've identified functions. Um, you, since you have all taken uh, quantum and 160, know about complex conjugation. And we may have even done a little of that in one of the versions of, of CompMet. 
namely z star is equal to x minus i y. And um, we use it often to uh, determine um, magnitudes of complex numbers. So if we look at the graphical representation, and we have a uh, complex uh, number x plus i y, here x and y, and this is theta. Then the complex conjugate has the same oops. has the same radius, but uh, the opposite angle, which means that z times uh, the complex conjugate um, is obviously x plus i y times x minus i y. If you do that all out, that's x squared plus y squared equals r squared. And so the square root of z conjugate times uh, complex conjugate of z is equal to z. Okay. Break here for just a second while I make sure I'm, any questions so far? Hopefully this is, has, how many people have seen this stuff already? Yeah? Okay, awesome. I apologize for starting slow and then speeding up. <clears throat> okay. What's the, in the graph? Yeah. What are those? Like I see the thetas, but what's before them? They're, oh, sorry. They're, my pen for some reason got a little bit long. They're just denoting oh. the angle. Okay. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So, all right. Just like deep blue again. I'll be very careful. Okay. Um, okay. So now we want to look at functions of complex uh, variables in order to do operations on them. So we're going to start with uh, the exponential form again. Um, and in particular, what we'll look at is uh, start with z to the n. That is going to be r to the i theta to the n or r to the n, e to the i n theta. Nothing really imaginative here. But that also means that e to the i n theta is equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta all raised to the n. This also helps us with um, there was a different way of looking at um, trig functions or tri trig identities. So um, we can start constructing things like cosine of n theta plus i sine n theta set equal to cosine plus i sine theta to the n as well. Um, we'll come back to that in just a second. But since we um, have developed this exponential form for complex uh, numbers, it means that multiplication and division is really to, relatively straightforward. Um, so if we think about multi multiplication and division, we've got 
say Z1 times Z2 is equal to R1, R2, technically R dot, uh, R1 uh, dot R2, times E, the I, theta, that's an I, theta 1 plus theta 2. And Z1 over Z2 is now the ratio of those uh, lengths times e to the i theta minus 1, theta minus 2. OK, so what does that get us? Um, it gets us something interesting graphically. Um, so if we, for example, want to evaluate and again, I'm, I'm, I apologize if these are toy problems, but I think on a Monday, toy problems are, are fine. Um, if we want to evaluate i, 1 plus i squared over 1 minus i, right? we have the tools to do this. Right? If we multiply top and bottom by a complex uh, conjugate of, of the denominator and so on, um, we can consider z1 is equal to 1 plus i. And what does that look like in our complex plane graph? One comma one. Right. So in particular, we have an angle of 45 degrees and a length of root 2. Right? So this is 1 plus i. And if we want to write this in our um, notation, you can either write it as cosine 45 degrees plus I sine 45 degrees or root two times E to the I five fourths. Okay. Um, Z two is equal to I minus one minus I. Okay. So that's just the opposite. And that's root 2 e to the minus i pi fourths. OK, so um, 1 plus i squared over 1 minus i then becomes 2 e to the i pi halves over root 2 e to the minus i pi fourths, which is root 2 e to the 3 i pi fourths, or i times 3 pi fourths. Um, in other words, this multiplication represents a rotation Same um, size, but now rotating through 3 pi fourths. Okay, so multiplying these two uh, complex numbers ends up having uh, the, the number being rotated through an angle of uh, 3 pi fourths. Okay. And if you wanted to represent that as numbers, then you could also write that as root 2 times minus 1 plus. Uh, roots. Since we have decided to uh, display these complex uh, numbers as exponentials, that means taking roots is relatively easy, but it also means that um, when we think of a complex number that can be just entirely real, there are additional complex roots that we have to, to worry about. So for example, z to the one, one over n, the, the nth root of z is equal to r to the i theta raised to the one nth power, or r to the one n, e to the i theta over n, or root n times cosine theta n plus i sine 
say that one. And I forgot that to add it. Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so another example. Um, what are the cube, the complex cube roots of eight? Right. So obviously for, for real, we know what that is. In this case, we have z is equal to eight. Um, so z to the one third is equal to the cube root of eight times cosine of theta third plus i sine theta third. So what's theta? Zero. Okay, but since we want to make this, we're going to have to look at it in thirds. What's the what's the better way for looking at this? What's equivalent? Six by three. 360, right? So in this case, or 2 pi, however you want to look at it, right? Because it's all lying on the real plane or the real axis. So if you think about x and y, we have 8 out here. Well, actually, that would be 8. Um, but we know that the cube root of 8 is equal to 2, but then we have minus one plus i root three and minus one minus i root three. In other words, um, if you think of a poorly drawn circle, the cube roots of uh, eight in a complex plane are all separated by 120 degrees. Okay, and we can do that with any complex number. Okay. But if we're dealing with something that is purely real, we start on, on the x-axis at 30, 360 degrees. Everybody with me? Since we're dealing with exponentials, we can also uh, look at the natural log. So natural log of C can be written as ln of r e to the i theta, which is equal to log, log natural log of r plus i theta. Um, but what's the issue here? Or well, what's a potential issue here? Uh, when R gets small, it goes to negative infinity. Well, that's true. So we'll, we'll see that uh, there are some issues with uh, singularity in this function. But what about this other term? What might be problematic for that i theta term? That's not something that we usually see in well-behaved, beha well well-defined functions. Theta could be anything. Like it could be zero, or it could be two pi, or it could be four pi. Right, so it's not that it could be anything, uh, but we can add um, 2n pi to this equation without changing the answer. In other words, unlike everything else that we uh, seen, have seen in this context, the natural logarithm of a complex number is multi-valued. And in fact, we'll uh, call 
and we'll see this in a couple of other cases, uh, the principal value of such a number as that first value is ln of r plus i theta. But realize that we can, not and this, this has a lot more uh, uh, implications for what for mapping, for what we call conformal mapping, mapping between the real plane and, and the complex plane, which is something we're not covering this term. And in fact, um, with um, numerical methods has become, with the rise of numerical methods has become less a topic of interest than it used to be. Um, a way that you could do some interesting problems, you could map a, do some analysis on a circle on the complex plane, map it to the real plane and the state depending on your mapping function and which principal value you're using would turn into basically the shape of an airfoil. Um, so you would do some aeronautics, basically doing the analysis in the complex plane and then transforming back to the real plane. Kind of interesting. But um, now we have Mathematica for that. So thanks. All right. Um, OK. I think one last thing before we can do some application. Um, and that is uh, uh, trig functions and exponentials. And I have assigned uh, one of these problems in your book. Uh, namely, um, we're going to, we know that. Um, We can write e to the i theta as cosine theta plus i sine theta, and e to the minus i theta as cosine theta minus i sine theta. Then we can write sine theta as e to the i theta minus e to the minus i theta over two to sine theta as e to the i theta plus e to the minus i theta over two. Let's see if they... And we can make similar statements for z if we wanted to, if we didn't want to um, look at uh, just theta. So a couple of remarks here. Um, Don't you need to divide for sine by i or multiply sine theta by i? Well, I yes, you're right. Yeah. Can you see that? You are absolutely right. Um, we have similar expressions, obviously, for hyperbolic functions for tan and you know, hyperbolic tangent functions and for logarithms. And um, one of the values is, of this is developing um, some, yeah, uh, developing some trig relations uh, that do pop up uh, sometimes in optics and um, a little bit of quantum when I think about it. So what we're going to do is uh, let's start with um, now that we know how this is this looks. Let's uh, start with what we want to do is connect, say, uh, sine and uh, natural log for complex numbers. Um, so there are a number in in your book uh, in one point eight. A number of um, relations between, say, inverse sine, inverse tangents, and hyperbolic uh, functions. If we let each, ah, there we go. Let's uh, let z be equal to sine theta to start. Um, we can write given a point 19, e to the, let's make sure I get this right, 
Let's start with e to the i theta is equal to 2i sine theta plus e to the minus i theta. We're just solving for e to the i theta. And we know that e to the minus i theta is equal to 2 times cosine theta minus e to the minus i theta. That means e to the i theta is equal to i sine rho. sine theta plus cosine theta. And that's equal to i sine theta plus the square root of 1 minus sine squared theta. So far, nothing really interesting happening. We're just doing trig functions. But now we substitute in this, um, this statement that we're letting this uh, complex uh, number z be equal to sine theta. That means that we have e to the i times inverse, apologize, sine of z, just from our definition up here, is equal to i z plus the square root of 1 minus z squared. That's easy enough. That should be then i times sine z, or inverse sine z, is equal to the log of i z plus the square root of 1 minus z squared. Or sine, inverse sine of z is equal to minus i natural log of i z plus the square root of 1 minus z squared. And you could take this a step further, right? z is equal to the sine of all of that. But what we're after are these relations and other relations that are on page 59 in your textbook. And then you have one problem where you're looking at, I think it's problem 1.8 eight, nine, which looks at um, how the inverse, oops, inverse tangent of x is related to a series or function of natural log tables. So, so one use of complex analysis is to create some of these relationships or these different expressions for inverse shape functions. All right, take a second here to shake it out, have some coffee, and do an application. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay, finally, an application. And it's an application I hope, I expect you have seen. If not, it, Maybe, maybe not, but hopefully it'll refresh your memory. So um, let's look at a circuit. Yay! So we'll have a variable uh, power supply here, voltage supply with the resistor. Ignore my horrible room. Circuit drawings, an inductor, and a capacitor. There. So we have R, uh, L, and C. And across each of these, of course, we have V sub R, uh, V sub L, and V sub C. Okay. All right. So what's the voltage across the resistor? I can see you two talking, so one of you has an answer. We said V, v equals IR. I don't, uh, that's what we were saying. 
Well, and Paul is right. Be proud of your knowledge. Heck yeah. Proud of your sophomore year knowledge. <laughs> About V, whoa. V sub L. Does anybody remember what that is? No? No? Okay. Um, that is proportional to the change in current, right? The inductance is a proportionality constant. You think about um, self-inductance and inductance in a circuit way back to Griffiths. And then um, what about the potential across the uh, capacitor? Right. Um, don't feel bad if you don't remember these, if you don't use them every day. Um, the only one you really probably should remember, I mean, honestly, is Ohm's law, right? The rest you can pick up from units and realizing that all of these things are constants of proportionality, right? That describe what's going on in the circuit. So um, what are we doing here? Let's let uh, the current be some oscillatory alternating current. So I naught times sine of omega t, right? And that means that V sub r is equal to r I naught sine omega t. No surprise there, the current's gonna be in phase or the voltage across the resistor is gonna be in phase with the current. Uh, v sub L, will be omega L I naught cosine omega T, just from that definition up here. We're taking the derivative of the current. Now we have to take the derivative of the potential or the integral of the current, so it flips the other way. So the, total, the potential across the capacitor is equal to minus one over omega C I naught, because we had to do that integration of cosine omega t. All right. All right, so we have expression for uh, the potential across each of those elements. What else do we know about the system? What has to be true? The voltages should all sum to zero. Yes, well, or sum to the initial, uh, to the uh, potential in the in the battery or the generator, right? So in other words, V should be equal to VR plus VL plus VC plus VC. Right, so if we want a total expression for uh, the potential across the circuit, we have to look at the circuit, the potential drops across the circuit and that has to be equal to the initial uh, potential of the circuit. All right. Now, the reason why uh, we all are all here, dearly beloved, sorry. This is a long morning already. Um, is that we've written the current as sine omega t, right? So what's the hint there? What can we do, right? We've, we've, we're assuming that we have an alternating current that looks like this. So how might we instead write the current as a function of t? In exponential form. Yes. So say some value, right? I naught times times e to the i omega t, right? What's the caveat here? What letter am I going to have to screw up drawing? R 
is the only one with the real component. Right, but we said that the current depends on sine. So in this case, the actual physical current is given by I, my God of uh, I, right? Because we're taking the sine component. If we were looking at cosine, we'd look at the root, right? But we are going to want, uh, we are going to uh, depend on the real component in just a second. All right, so this is, this is one lesson here is that we can represent these complex numbers uh, in terms of, of uh, addition of real and uh, imaginary parts. But when we uh, represent something like a circuit, we need to know which part of that we're, we're looking at. And so if we're only concerned with the imaginary part of this representation, we can use this exponential expression. All right, so that means that if we go back, if we rewrite what we had up there, given this expression for i, we have vr is equal to r times i naught e to the i omega t. But that's just, lo and behold, Ohm's law. Okay? V sub l is equal to i omega l i naught e to the i omega t. And that's equal to I omega L times I. So one of the reasons why we like complex uh, analysis and complex numbers is that it makes uh, the analysis of a circuit easy, right? V sub C is then one over I omega C, I naught E to the I omega T, it's an I. J equals one over I omega C times I. So now we've reduced it all in terms of I. So V, the total uh, voltage is VR plus VL plus VC is equal to R plus I times omega L minus one over omega C where we've implicitly done the complex conjugate for one over I times i. What do we call the stuff in the brackets? The impedance. Right. Um, and we can, in fact, what we properly call it is the complex impedance, capital Z, right, so that we can rewrite essentially Ohm's law for a complex circuit, right? So it means that the complex impedance Z is equal to R plus I omega L minus one over omega C, right? What do we, uh, what does this tell us? What does this get us? For a circuit that's oscillating. What do you use impedance for? Is it like when there's that peak, like a low, like low frequencies and high frequencies are filtered out? Yes, and what do we call that phenomenon? What do we call that phenomenon when we look at coupled harmonic oscillators or a forced uh, harmonic oscillator? Dampening? No, although it has dampening in it from the resistance, right? This is kind of like looking at and analyzing something like a forced damped harmonic oscillator. Resonance. Resonance, right. So we get resonance when Z is real, right? So that happens when omega L is equal to one over omega C, 
or the resonant frequency for an L RLC circuit is equal to the square root of one over LC. Coming to the GRE question near you. Sorry, 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 look, sorry, sorry, sorry. But does that look familiar? In other words, the square root of LC gives you a time constant as well. It's maybe where you saw it in electronics. I don't know. Okay, so the point of all of this was to lay the background for uh, complex numbers and then uh, show that you can use this in a physically interesting system, at least one. And you'll get some practice with in this first, essentially uh, chapter 1.8, playing around with some of these ideas. Okay. Are there any questions on any of this? No. Um, well, we have a, a little bit of time. I don't know whether I want to start on this next section or not. So why don't I open it up for if you've got questions on the homework. Oh, Steven or no, Nick, one of you two. Get in there. Next you. <laughs> okay, for the direct equation one, it's just, it's supposed to be messy, right? It is supposed to be messy. So okay. if you look, so this is, um, let me get this over here. This is, uh, so for the homework, 1.3.11. Um, you know, you have E equals MC squared times one plus gamma squared over uh, S plus N minus root K all squared to the minus a half, right? Okay, so my recommendation, there are a couple of ways you can do this. Step one would be to expand all this star. Uh, expand star uh up to um terms that include gamma to the four okay so that's just a binomial expansion that will include three terms uh, a term square term and um, gamma to the fourth term then step two would be solve pass you're given uh, that S is uh, equal to um, the absolute value of K squared minus gamma squared um, to the one half. Right? But you can write S so that uh, solve S and then expand it in terms of another binomial expansion. But here, because of all of the layers of multiplication, you only need to expand it to terms that include gamma squared. Okay. Step three is to substitute uh, that S back into, call this star here, double star, your expanded form of that first equation. That means you're gonna have basically one minus one term with minus, yeah, and then plus another term. And step four is you're going to expand each of these and then combine all terms, dropping anything greater than gamma to the fourth. And the result should be that you have uh, three terms, a constant term, a gamma squared term, and a gamma to the fourth term. Does that make sense? It will be a little bit messy. But if you, I think where some people have 
uh, made it a little too hard on yourselves is that you might have expanded that to gamma to the fourth. Don't do that because you'll end up with uh, a third order polynomial multiplying stuff and you don't need that. Uh, Nick, does that sound okay to you? Stephen, was that your question? Uh, no, my question was on 1.2.3. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, essentially just, um, I think testing for convergence isn't too bad, but testing for uniform convergence, do we have to find the actual value of the series or is there another way to do it? No, it's actually really straightforward. Um, the, most of the work is actually, and there's not much work to it, is in part A. Part B is essentially back, is recognizing that you have to back off the endpoint by some small number, say S. So once you find the bounds for convergence in part A, then it's uniformly convergent for all values of X that's a little bit away from the lower bound. Right, so if you look at examples in the book, they say this is uh, convergent between say one or minus one and one and uniformly convergent between S and one where S is greater than minus one. Okay, make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I think there that's another problem where you can make it harder because the book for as much as I love Arfkin, it's very opaque. It is. Um, what about the um, Olber's paradox? Everybody get that one? Eh. I mean, I guess you're given what you're supposed to find. So one way or the other, a miracle happens, right? I mean, it's a geometric series based on how the fraction of sky you can't see as you keep going out. So once you have that down, then you can use what the uh, value of the geometric series is. Um, any of the other problems in 1.3? Or are those pretty straightforward? Or have you not gotten to them yet? I have a question about 1.2.5. Okay. Um, I guess I, I kind of like, tried doing what I guess your notes did and what the book did when there wasn't an X in there. And that's like saying that the L term is negligible. Yep. But I, it looked like I was supposed to use like the Gauss's test, but I didn't get something that looked like the Gauss's test. And I didn't really know. Yeah, I don't know. I wasn't really sure how to. Yeah, for 1.2.5, I mean, there, uh, you can just, you, you, you Look at that ratio. Um, oh, Jeez. sorry, that, that was in my notification, my bad. Okay, no, that's okay. Um, yeah, I don't want to run over time here. Um, basically, if you look at the ratio of this, as J goes to infinity, the constants drop out, right? And then you're looking at what, how do you constrain X itself? So that in this case, the, um, since you have those successive terms, um, you're actually bounding the values of X. Okay. So the, the, so J plus two and J are two successive terms. So if you take the ratio of that, and as J goes to infinity, essentially the constant term in, in front of that ratio goes to one. If you look at, they're both J squared. Okay. Right. So that means in order for that to work, that gives you a pretty stringent region in which X, uh, in which this expansion will work for X. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, at the Gaussian test for this is overkill. Okay. Yeah. N is actually testing something somewhat, it's a little bit different because this is looking at um, a, a, a function rather than an actually series. Remember, there's, there is some confusion, and I know that this can be the case about the coefficients, the sequence of numbers that might be multiplying a function. Right? We started by looking at uh, infinite series of numbers, and then we looked at functions or numbers time multiplying functions, power series. And those are two separate things. Um, 1.2.5 is looking at a, a series of functions and the constants still in front of them. 
rather than say the geometric series or any other series of numbers. So we're looking at, in essence, a radius of convergence or a region of convergence. Anything else? All right, um, if you have any other questions, um, ping me, I'll be around. I've got an independent study at three. Um, and although I don't have any office hours, I'll be around. I have to uh, go nowhere, actually. So I'm here. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, take care. Be safe. We'll uh, get into Laurent and, Co and Koshi stuff next time, which will be pretty cool, I think. That's when we're integrating around infinities, which is always awesome. Okay. Bye, guys. I will. Uh... Bye, Meg. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Aww.